Who wants to get in the Word of God? Say aye. aye. All right. Well, we're in the book of Colossians. Today we get to start chapter 3. And we get to revisit, as every Sunday, the good news. The good news. I wonder if any of you ever felt like growing up the good news was more like the bad news with a good twist at the end of it. Did anyone ever feel like that a little bit? The good news had a lot of, lot of bad news. It felt there's, there's some good news in there, but man, that bad news was heavy. The heavy bad news part of it. Sometimes I think the good news comes across like the bad news with the silver lining. But uh, I really think it's the good news if we see it from the beginning to the end. I think it's all, all good news. In the Colossian church, this letter, it was important because they had some bad news. They, uh, Epaphras, their uh, pastor, went and talked to Apostle Paul while he's in prison, said, hey, we got some bad news. Our church is getting off track. We're getting tricked. We're getting deceived. We got some false teachers that are coming into the church. We got some philosophies from external, from this culture and society we live in, but it's finding our way into the Christian church, and our Christian brothers and sisters are starting to believe some weird stuff, and they're starting to, I don't know, beat themselves and starve themselves and don't do this, don't do this. They're adding rules to God's rules. They're, uh, you know, they're believing more spiritual experiences will make me feel complete. If I just have a visit from an angel, that'll make me feel complete. If I, maybe if I worship an angel, it'll make me feel complete. They're having all kinds of different societal, cultural isms, humanism, asceticism, Gnosticism, pluralism, finding their way into the church, and they're getting off track. That was bad news. But man, that's not the whole story. God has good news, and God wants to get us back on track because there is a good track. I don't feel like I need to remind you that this morning before we get into the this chapter, which is a heavy theological chapter. There's some of probably the most like profound little verses, maybe in the whole Bible. I mean, should, am I allowed to say that? That seems kind of blasphemous for me to make that statement. But there's some you could you could you take your favorite pen and circle a lot of little phrases in chapter three of Colossians, and that could probably get you through the whole year. I'm telling you what, if you just ate those verses over and over again, you could probably have one of the best years of your life. It's that good, and we're going to read some of those verses today. But I think it's important for us to know that it doesn't start there, and the story of the Colossians doesn't start there, and the story of your life doesn't start there, and the story of the Bible doesn't start there. It starts with God, the perfect God, who is the God of love. He's the God of the universe. He's the eternal God, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in perfect unity, this perfect relationship in the triune Godhead, and their dream to multiply the image, the image of God. And I want you to be reminded of that this morning before we jump into these discussions about sin and the bad news, that it started with good news that God made man, male and female, in the image of God. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said it is very good. Genesis 1. That's where your story starts. And I don't know every detail of your story. Some of you have been vulnerable and shared your story. And some of you have some twists and turns in your story. Some of you still finding your way back to the right path. Some of you guys are finding your way back to the Jesus track, to the God track. Um, But I just want to be really clear. God is the track. He is the path. And you were made to be on that track, the image of God. God made you because he wanted to look down and see his glory reflected. He wanted to see his goodness in human form with skin on. That's why God made you. You give him pleasure. You give him delight. I was talking to my kids this week and one of my employees came over for dinner, and this guy's a really sweet guy, and he was getting a lot of attention from, from, from dad. I'm the dad at my house. Um, surprise, surprise. Anyways, um, and, uh, you know, he, we have a good night, eat tacos, give this guy a lot of attention and love. And then uh, my kids are climbing all over me for attention. I'm just like, what is going on? I put my kids to bed. I say, hey, I talk to my sons. I say, who do you think Josh loves more? Who does daddy love more? Does he love the employee or does he love his sons? And my, my sons were confused. They said, Daddy loves his employee. I said, oh, fail, epic fail. I'll let you get away with that because you're three. But we got to fix this right here and there. No, and we just went through the list. Who does Daddy love more, so-and-so or Phineas? We went through all your names. I just made it really clear. Daddy loves his son the most. I went through everyone I know. I wanted my son to know. No, Daddy loves his son. I don't know. It kind of reminds me. I think some of us need to know that sometimes. Daddy loves his sons. Daddy loves his daughters more than anyone else. I know we don't need to compare and show partiality, but God loves you the most. And you can believe that about yourself more than anything else, more than you on your bad days, more than so-and-so's opinion of you. God loves you for who you really are, for your potential, for the image of God inside of you. And that's why getting off track is a big deal. 
That's why getting off track is a big deal. Because God made us with purpose to be this thing, the image of God. So I want to start there as we read this today. And Colossians is going to use some of that language. It's going to talk about the image of the one. And talk about being renewed in our minds. So why don't we pray and then why don't we jump in? You guys, are, you guys ready for a good morning? All right. Well, Father, we just welcome you to fully rewire our minds this morning. In any way where our minds have started to see you or ourselves wrongly, we, we invite you to just get our minds back renewed in the truth this morning and right back to right thinking, seeing you rightly and seeing ourselves rightly. Thank you that your word, every time we open it, it's an invitation to, to get our minds right again. We know our spirit is right through faith in Christ, but our minds get off track. So we, we, we welcome this invitation to get back completely on the track in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I think I just want to start by reading this chapter with you, and then I'd like to break it down and explain it verse by verse. So let's, we're going to read at least the first half of this chapter today. Colossians 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, and other versions say since you have been, because this is a assumptive, presumptive statement rather than a question. Since you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked. When you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. And we're going to have to stop there. Otherwise, we'll be celebrating and reading this all day long. But I've got to uh, limit it and call it there. So let's go back to the very first part of this reading, chapter 3, verse 1, starts with this word, therefore. And therefore, anytime there's a therefore in the scripture, we have to figure out what it's there for, and we have to review and go backwards, and that's what therefore is about. And before we do that, I feel like I should tell you, um, we're jumping, we're playing jump the line now because we're at the halfway point in this letter, not just because the uh, Bible uh, writers put these numbers in there, but because Paul's letter has a natural break right here. And it shifts and it hinges. Chapter 1 and chapter 2, or the first portion of Paul's letter, have been all about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And now, since Paul feels like he's covered that, he's got us grounded in the supremacy of Jesus, he can talk to us now about life. He can talk about our submission to Christ, our practical, personal walk with Christ. But Paul knows you can't just start there. And I've illustrated with my boxes before, that in the Christian life, it doesn't start with what you're doing every day. It starts with who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. And then on top of that is our identity, who we are, and in a relationship with him. And then we can talk about everyday life, behavior, fruitfulness, serving God, impact, influence, etc. So that's where we are in this letter. It's hinging. It's swinging now to talk about everyday life. How many of you guys are practical people? You like practical stuff. Anyone like practical life? This chapter is kind of your language, but don't get too excited. It's not like again, we're, we're not going to just jump away from Jesus. We're still going to stick with him. He is the theme through this whole letter. All right, so we have to review because it says therefore. So we're going to jump back, and I'm just going to read quickly what the therefore was all about. Let's go back to chapter 2, verse 16, and 
We remember Paul was telling us no one's to act as your judge, Colossian church, in regard to food, drink, or any of these festivals, new moons, Sabbath days, things which are a mere shadow of what's to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So last week we learned that you can't make people stop judging you, but we can turn down our sensitivity to people judging us. People trying to uh, control us with their ideas of what's good spirituality, religion, etc. We are not subject to people's opinions anymore. We're only subject to Jesus Christ. What he says goes. He is our judge, um, but we escape his wrath through trusting in his sacrifice. And um, we're subject to him. All those other things that people try to hold over your head, you need to eat this way, celebrate this way, uh, you need to do this, do that, all these legalism stuff, we're not subject to it anymore. And we don't. And verse 18 says, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement, worship of angels, taking people's stand on visions they've seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth, growth which is from God. What's he saying there? Saying a lot of people, they're not really holding fast to Jesus and growing like we're meant to. They're trying to do it by themselves in weird ways. I had a hyper spiritual experience. Look at me. I met with an angel. Look at me. I am beating my body with whips. Look at me. I, that's just weird, but hey, that was a thing back then. Maybe it is today too. People really trying to steal all sense of enjoyment and pleasure from their life to make God happy. Sad, the kind of deception we can fall into. Verse 20, if you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why is if you were living in the world, you submit to these decrees? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. They all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have to be sure in the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement, severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So that all is the therefore that Paul is referring to. He's saying we can't please God by just making more rules and trying to follow them. Whether it's be more spiritual or be more religious or don't do this or don't do that, only Jesus can cause real growth and completeness in us. Only Jesus. That's the therefore. So now we jump back into chapter 3, practical living. What are we going to start with, Paul? What's it going to be? Never miss church again? Read my Bible three hours every day? I'm ready, Paul. Tell me what I have to do, because I'm good with formulas. Tell me, Paul. I'll put on my best Jesus holy pants, and I'll put on my Jesus shirt. I'll do whatever you say, and I've got that bumper sticker peeled, and I'm, I'm tagging my car and yours today. Just tell me what to do. All right, he will. And he says, therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Oh, Paul, I wanted something. That's so abstract. I don't get it, Paul. I want something practical. Give me a checklist. Give me a checklist. Mm -mm. Jesus, keep seeking the things above. So what's he talking about? Well, he's kind of referring back to our identity because he says the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And he reminds us that we've been raised up there with Christ. He's saying, remember where you are now, that positionally... If you're a Christian, you live in fr from heaven. That's where you live. And the kingdom of God lives inside of you by the Holy Spirit. And this is to be our primary pursuit. And that was my first point today. If you want to like get five points, I made five. That's number one. Jesus' kingdom is my primary pursuit. Keep seeking mm -hmm. the things above. And I would say that to you today that that's really the key. If you're always looking for a formula, a hack, Google's going to tell me the, the top 10 things to finally feel happy, to finally cut out my bad behavior and get the good habits only. Jesus has another story. He says, keep your mind up here where we're living together from heaven. Stay seeking after my kingdom, this invisible realm of God's domain. I don't know. I feel led to draw some pictures today. Let me bring this over. Read a couple more verses. Two was set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you've died and your life's hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who's our life, is revealed, you also will be revealed with him in glory. So I feel like when you talk about this whole kingdom thing and how to set our minds on him. Well, I've shown you this before, that 
uh, Jesus doesn't want to be part of your pie chart. This is pie chart Christianity. It's like, uh, I don't know why I have such a hard time drawing a pie chart. There it goes. But God, it's like, sometimes we act like this. All right, I got family. That's a big part of my life, right? Family first. Family first. Anyone ever? Yeah, family first. And then I have to go to work, okay? My career is important. That's how I take care of my family. And I've got to take care of my health. I mean, God wants me to love my neighbor as myself, right? Self, health, got that? All right, and then I've got to, what else have I done? Well, my finances, uh, that's important. Well, maybe I should make that less important. Let's make my friends. Those are really important. Uh, what else? Uh, I've got to, my mind, I've got to read. I've got to learn. Um, and then, of course, God, he deserves a part of my life. God, come be a part of my life. I'm going to give you 10%. That sounds biblical. You get 10% of my life. You know what? We're going to raise that to 11%. Cost of living increase. God, you get 11% of my life, and there's more things over here. I'm going to fill those in. I always like to tell you this. God hates your pie chart. He does not like your pie chart at all. God doesn't want anything to do with your pie chart. And let me tell you what else it doesn't mean to seek the things above. Or Matthew 6, 33, seek the first kingdom. It doesn't mean this. That God wants me to prioritize my life. God wants me to get my priorities in order. Priorities. This is a prior priority. God, you come first now in my life. And then family. And then work. And then friends. And then, wait, no, I should do health. Where's health? Oh gosh, I'm having a crisis. Well, I've not been taking care of my health. Health, work, fi uh, finances, uh, friends. Uh, oh gosh. But as, as long as I know God's first, then God will be happy, right? I love you, but God hates your priority chart. He does not like your priority list one little bit. And that's not what it means to seek first God's kingdom. So this is what it means. It's that we have been First of all, rescued from a kingdom. This is the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness. And this is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus, where Jesus reigns. And the story of the Bible is that because of sin, we became a slave to this kingdom. Here's you. We're not happy down there. Not a good place to be. But Jesus rescues us, delivers us, and transfers us into his domain, his territory, his kingdom, Smiley, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus. And now we live here and we've been rescued here. We live from here. This is our citizenship. This is your new identity. I don't care if you live in, you know, Mars or Idaho or California. God says, if you're a Christian, this is your citizenship. This is your primary place of residence. And we live from heaven. We're a foreigner on earth. Um, and then to seek first the kingdom means we don't just live on the fringe out here. God didn't just rescue us now to sit comfortably on the fringe. We are every day exploring the depths of God's kingdom, this invisible realm that is so real, realer than the things we see with our eyes. We're exploring it every day. We're seeking after it. There's treasures of wisdom and discovery in God's kingdom, and we're setting our mind on those things. It's not a denial of our life on earth. It's a preoccupation with our life and his kingdom. It's one has to be primary and greater. And it helps us, you know, th living in God's kingdom teaches us how to then love our family, teaches us how to manage our finances, teaches us how to uh, do work and employment. It teaches us how to do ministry. It teaches us how to take care of our health, teaches us how to manage our friendships, that's what happens when we are kingdom first, kingdom first, seeking the kingdom of God, seeking these things above. So number one, Jesus, his kingdom becomes my primary pursuit and it becomes my present preoccupation. So let's read a little more. What's this whole thing about dying? Verse three says we died and our life is hidden with Christ and God. Well, Jesus becomes our life. He becomes the entirety of of your life. I really think I need to tell you that today. It goes back to the pie chart. Jesus doesn't want to be a part of our life. When you become a Christian, Jesus comes to the center of your life, not the top of your priority list, not the biggest sliver of your pie chart. He becomes the entirety of our life, the center of our life. And the way Paul says it, it's almost like we made a trade. We sent this old life and we let it get buried with Christ in the cave. 
that life that was me at the center and my wisdom leading, and I'm steering the wheel, and God's a part of my life, maybe, somewhat. We put that life away. It's the old life and the new life hidden with Jesus, hidden with Christ in God. Uh, it reminds us of Galatians 2, 19 through 20. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And now I li- the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. It's this old life put away and this new life in Jesus. I want to talk about that for a second more. Um, sometimes when we talk about old life and new life, we make this mistake. We think the old life is me before I converted, and the new life is me after I converted, period. And I want to tell you that's part of it, but it's not the whole of it. How many of you have ever seen a part of you since conversion that still maybe resembled a little bit of the old life? Can anyone raise their hand with me? Okay, so there's got to be more to this thing than just the old life is me before I converted to Christianity. So the old life, the new life, is about really a dead life and new life and is represented by connection to Jesus, not so much a timeline. So dead life is me separate from Jesus. Any part of my life that I'm living separate from Jesus is actually the old life. It's that dead life. I don't have a good drawing for this, but I was thinking about it. It's kind of like any time, I don't know how to say this. We have still access to our old life. I want you to know that. And by the way we think, we can breathe life, little bits of breath into that old life or that old self. Even though the Bible is teaching us as a Christian, that thing got murdered, it got destroyed, it got crucified. We have this ability, we have this freedom that we can still unfortunately, mistakenly blow life into that old self. I mean, I think that's bad news. That is bad news. That's why sometimes you're like, I don't get it. I'm a Christian and I still feel like gossiping about my brother in Christ. I'm a Christian, but I still feel like wasting three days just binging and just med- over-medicating to make my pain go away. I, I'm a Christian, but I still find myself, I don't know, addicted or habitually crossing lines and sinning. That's because the old life, we still have access to it, but we have an option. We have an option. That's what Paul is trying to say, and it's to murder it, and it's to consider it murdered. And it's not with a physical weapon. It's with faith. So let's read a little bit more. Verse 5, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead, dead to immorality, impurity, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. So Other translations of this verse, it doesn't say consider, it says kill. Um, So there's this thing where we have, at this moment, you have access still to your old self and your new self. And you have this choice, this privilege in Christ. You can consider that thing dead. And day by day, through keeping our minds in God's truth, you can never breathe life into that thing again. And it can stay dead. I mean, it's just kind of a morbid example, but I don't know. It's like if you had to murder a rabid, I'm just going to go there for a minute. Sorry if this is not the best illustration, but it's the one that came to my mind. Some morbid, rabid animal, some dog has got rabies that's just trying to bite you, and you had to take old Yeller back out in the field and put a bullet in him. You have to keep him dead. You have to keep him dead. And like in this thing, we have this old flesh, this old self. We can breathe life back into it by believing little lies. It's kind of a tragedy. But man, the good news is that Paul's saying we can keep that thing dead. We can keep it dead by considering it dead. And for you guys who like a checklist and you like something practical, this is kind of abstract because this is one step. Trust. Trust that what God says is true. If he says it's dead, start to believe it. Start to believe it. Start to confess it. If there's a part of your life, your old life, your old self that keeps trying to creep up, currently feels like it's overwhelming you and consuming you, start to tell it what Jesus says. Hey, no, no, you're dead. I put a bullet in your head. You had rabies. I didn't want you around my family anymore. We put you out. We put you under. You don't come back anymore. If it's anxiety, start telling your anxiety, I'm sorry, you're part of my old self. You know, it says, no, no, no. You've been a Christian 30 years and struggling with anxiety. That's not the truth of God's word. That's, you belong in the grave with Jesus. You're my old self. Goodbye. I'm alive to the new self. I live with faith now. I live with trust now. I live with peace now. That's the way we talk ourselves into renewal, talk ourselves into walking in the image of God. So the first thing Paul references 
is not our anxiety, it's not our checklist, it's actually sexuality. And this could be a hot topic. I know today people think uh, at church we should talk about one thing only, and that's tolerance, love, kindness. Shouldn't talk about politics, shouldn't talk about sexuality. And the Bible does. The Bible does. The Bible relates to everything. And one of the first things God talks about here is sexuality. And so that might, that might irritate someone in here. That might irritate someone. Like, why is God always, what's he got about sex? Why is it always my sex life? Why is it always keep your pants on? And God doesn't want me to have any fun. He doesn't care about my pleasure and my desires. And he just doesn't understand me. And he doesn't know what I've been through and the trauma and this. So that's, that's actually not the case. God, I just want to remind you real quick, God made sex. God did. And he's not a pleasure stealer. He invented pleasure. And there's parts of the human body, I'm not going to get all into this, that are only there for pleasure. They exist for no other reason. So God is all about pleasure, but he's into sustained pleasure that isn't used by your enemy to destroy you. And that's the issue with sexuality. As Paul knows, as God knows, that sexuality is a sacred and spiritual part of our life. It's going to also talk about finances. It's going to go right into greed. It's talking about the same thing. Managing resources is not just a practical math little side sliver of our life. It also has a very sacred and spiritual element to it. We're going to read on pretty soon talk about our language, our words. It's not just something where when we're at church, we talk holy. And then when we go to work, we talk like the construction slash sailors. Uh, our language is sacred and spiritual. So why does he start with sexuality? Like I told you, because sexuality is deeply spiritual. Deeply spiritual. And today in our culture, people have really, really tried to rewrite the narrative on sexuality. It's just for fun. There's no rules. It's whatever a culture decides. One rule only, as long as it's consensual. I hear these things quite frequently. Uh, my body, my choice. Um, I define my morality Church, stay off my body. Church, stay off my religion. And those all things, they all have a little bit of a ring of, I don't know, goodness to them. But the Bible has another story that God gave us the gift of our bodies and the gift of sexuality. And God made this beautiful uh, picture of himself, his glory, eternal relationship in the Trinity when he gave us marriage, covenant marriage between a man and a woman, one man, one woman for one lifetime. Uh, divorce, the door stays closed. Obviously, the, this is what God, this is God's heart. It's not saying these things never happen, but saying this is what God's heart is. One man, one woman in a covenant, unconditional commitment, love, and devotion, acceptance, forgiveness to each other for one lifetime. And that is the place where God says to enjoy this gift of sexuality and learn to enjoy it and study how to enjoy it more and learn to serve your spouse with this gift. That is the, the biblical outlook on sexuality and everything outside of that, which I've just described to you in the Bible, gets thrown into this junk drawer term. The Bible uses immorality. I think the Greek word is porneia. And it's it, it just, you could list anything you could think of outside of God's covenant of marriage, every type of sexual seeking for pleasure outside of God's way is immorality. And you might say, you know what? Why does God care so much? I just want to have a little fun. Well, I, I still can trust God and sleep with my girlfriend. I still can trust God and experiment with other lifestyles. Why can't God just let me be a Christian and do sex my way? Like I told you, because sex ultimately is a spiritual thing given to us from our master. And Jesus is not the only one seeking to be our master through spiritual holds. There is an enemy and he wants to find a way through the most spiritual parts of our lives to take a hold on us. And sexuality is absolutely one of them. This is not a, an angry, you know, group of men running churches trying to suppress all the teenagers so they don't end up in bed. That's not what this is about. This is not a way to control you. This is not a way to make you triggered with fear and shame so you'll obey all the rules. No, this is a loving father deeply wanting to protect you from an enemy who wants to destroy you. And that is absolutely what happens when we give over ourself to the other master, to Satan. That's why Paul here is jumping right in. You ready to get practical? Let's go with the big one. Let's offend everyone right off the bat. Quit sinning sexually. In fact, consider every bit of your body and your mind dead to sexual sin. You're like, well, you, you don't know my past. You don't know how I was last week. That's not what this says. It says start considering yourself dead. It's a choice to believe a certain way. 
Well, we just have we just have a lot of problems in that area. Well, start saying another narrative over your life and marriage, because God has solutions. God has answers. Dead to immorality, dead to impurity. He's just naming it every way he can. Passion. That's not talking about good passion that we pour into our marriage. It's talking about passion we're trying to fill in every other way except for within the marriage. Evil desire and greed. And he throws money in there in case we thought that was okay. He throws greed in there, all which amount to idolatry. It all goes back to who is our master? Who is our master? Is it the one who made us in his image, loves us, and wants to keep us in his goodness, shining his glory close to his heart? Or is it our enemy, Satan, who wants to deceive us. You know, Satan doesn't want you to worship him. He wants you to worship yourself. He wants you to choose your sin and yourself over God. He doesn't want you to do a Satan ritual. Maybe maybe he'll take it there for some people, but he'd be very happy if we just believe this lie that Satan's not there. That's a primitive belief. That's what old, primitive, rule-following, oppressive Christians believe. Now, Satan has you right where he wants you. And we need to read on. So, like I said, the Bible and the gospel, it's the good news, but there is a twist. So we're going to read about that. Verse 6, it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. In church, I'm really open about this. At this church, we believe in the God of love. We also believe he is 100% also the God of wrath. He 100% is perfect love. More than anyone can ever love you, ever will, God does. Also, God is completely righteously angry and filled with wrath at anything that hinders his perfect love. We're not ashamed of that. I don't need a bullhorn and a sign with flames to go declare that. It's not the way I open conversations, but we don't need to hide that either. God is so in love with you that anything that hinders his perfect love makes him angry. And there is a place for his wrath. And the gospel says that Jesus Christ came from heaven down to us as a savior, as our substitute, taking a sacrifice for us, for our sin, breaking the power of sin, taking the penalty of sin, taking the wrath of the Father on himself for us. He took what we deserve because of sin. Jesus took the wrath of God for you. So when you read about that in the Bible, you can't let Satan condemn you. Some of you still believe lies that God is angry at me. If you're a Christian, he's not. He's not. Jesus took the anger, the righteous anger of the Father for you. Well, I made mistakes. I'm still in bad habits. Yep, Jesus took past, present, and future all of your sins for you. He took the wrath of God. But it will come upon the sons and daughters of disobedience. Let's read verse 8. But now you also put them all aside. Put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander. It's another word for gossip. And abusive speech from your mouth. So we went from um, our thoughts surrendered to Jesus the King, seeking his kingdom. We jumped into sexuality, the sacred part of our life, with a mention of greed. And now Paul is saying, here's what I want you to do next. Surrender every word that comes out of your mouth to Jesus. Christians, that's what we do. It reminds me of um, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only that which is edifying, that it might give grace in the moment. So Jesus here, or Paul rather, is saying, every word now, give it over to Jesus. In fact, consider all other types of emotions that'll control your life and language from your mouth. Consider it dead. Put it all aside. It's like you had this, I don't know, I've been, this whole week, I've been thinking of clothing. I've been thinking of clothing that's like, oh, here's a good one. It's like, let's just say you did a crazy diet. What's that TV show called where they, you know, cut their weight in half. I don't know what it is. Anyways, let's just say you had to buy a bunch of new clothes because the old ones don't fit you anymore. That's how it is in Jesus. The old clothes don't fit you anymore. So why are we still wearing them? Why are we still wearing them? Sometimes we still believe, well, they kind of still fit me. I'm still struggling. I, I kind of feel like I'm, I feel like we, and I'm saying we because it's me too. I feel like sometimes we believe that changing as a Christian is this long drawn out process. And don't get me wrong, I think growth is a real thing and God causes growth. I can't deny that. But sometimes change is immediate. It's as soon as we catch a thought about our life and we change it and we say, oh, no, 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 that's not me anymore. That was my old self. I put a bullet in that thing with Jesus. Old yeller is buried in the backyard, 
old me is buried in the tomb with Jesus, and I rose again with him on the cross. That's what the Bible says. And me gossiping with my buddy, uh, we don't do that anymore. That was my old self. I, I still feel tempted sometimes, but it's the old, it's old yeller trying to raise from the dead. He's dead. I don't even want to look at him anymore. That's, that's how we put things aside. We talk to it. We remind it that it's dead. Well, you just don't know, Josh. I just have a lot of PTSD that triggers thing in me. It's, it's my environment. It's the coworkers I work with. It's my family members. They trigger all these things in me. Now, I don't think any of those external or internal influences are stronger than the influence of Jesus Christ and his truth in your life. I think it's which one are we listening to? Some of us really need to change the narrative that we're telling ourselves. Jesus is your exit from your old self. He broke the penalty, he broke the power, and he breaks the path of sin in our life. He's our exit. He's, the, he's our murderer. I never said that before. I never heard anyone say that, but I feel like I need to tell you that. In this context, Jesus is your old self murderer and your new self resurrector. Um, I need to show you this too. So... Here's an illustration. I think transformation can be really complex. Sometimes we make it more complex than it is. Um, but this we know is that when we become a... There's, let's say, three faculties within the human. There's the spirit. There's the soul, which includes our mind, will, and emotions. And then there's our body. Some people call that the flesh. But I think in the Bible, the flesh also bleeds into the area of the soul. So when we become a Christian, this part here gets saved. Jesus comes in. Holy Spirit comes in. And uh, we get saved. Our spirit is completely saved. So that is truth. Your spirit is saved by Jesus if you've trusted in Jesus as your Lord. But our soul and our mind, the Bible says, needs to be renewed. Like this is an ongoing process. That's your thoughts. This is our responsibility. This is Jesus' responsibility this is our responsibility. We open the word of God. We agree with the Holy Spirit. We exist in healthy community with Christians. We sit under good, sound Bible teaching. Uh, we celebrate and with overflow with gratitude for what the Bible says about me. And my mind is renewed. And like this verse says, we put on the new self who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So, and then my body, um, you're still stuck with your old body, whether you're a Christian or not. But one day, this, the scriptures tell us you're going to get a new body. It will be saved. So, another way to look at this is your spirit has been saved. Your soul is being saved. Your body will be saved. But this is your responsibility right here, is your soul, your mind, your thoughts. Telling the dead part of you, the old part of you, it's dead. So we're putting on the new self, renewing our mind in a true knowledge according to the image who created us. Uh, and it, this is a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew. These were the common distinctions of the time. I could make plenty of distinctions now. Our culture is obsessed with making distinctions. Um, but there's no distinction now between Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man. But Christ is all and in all. What's that saying? Your identity is Christ. It's not what culture you grew up in. It's not anything else on this earth that you can align with. It's not any allegiance to anything or anyone else. It's to Jesus. It's to Jesus. And I would ask you that today. What's your allegiance to Jesus look like? If you're not a Christian in your spirit, have you surrendered yourself to Jesus? Do you need to surrender your life to Jesus? And then, fellow Christians, I would ask you now, how are you doing at renewing your mind, your thoughts, as a Christian? How are you doing at speaking to your old self? Not just the self that before conversion, but the self that's more aligned with the master Satan that wants to tell you, oh, that's still you, the anxiety, the bad habits, the addiction, uh, the slander, the language, my thoughts, whatever. Um, I realize, you know, some people read this, I realize, and it says, consider yourself dead, kill the old self, and they, go, they turn to uh, Jesus, Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And I realize that also is a valid way to deal with sin, but I see these as two different approaches, both important. So, for instance, if drinking 
oh, drunkenness is, is, your, is your problem. And you're like, ah, I'm just really struggling with substance. I just can't get away from it. Every time I go to the bar with my buddies, I don't know why, I just get sloshed and drink, you know, one beer turned into 14. Um, what, what Jesus would say is stop going to the bar. Totally, that's what he'd say. Um, but what Paul would say is in addition to stop going to the bar, stop, start telling yourself, I'm not an alcoholic anymore. Start saying that. Yeah, I stay away from the bar because I can go into it, but that's not my identity anymore. I can, I'm consumed with Jesus, and he's my substance now. I consume him all the way. Start telling yourself there's a new self now. I'm not sitting there waiting to get tempted by a drink and a binge. I'm consumed with Jesus. I'm fulfilled with Jesus. Um, so they're both, they're both true. They're both important. Does that make sense? Cool. Well, I think I want to invite the ministry team up. Man, you guys did good today. I feel like that was a, a heavy chapter. You guys handled that well. I'd like to invite the ministry to come forward. Sam and Diane, and I'd also like to invite everyone to stand with me, and I'd just like to invite you into a moment of reflection. Um, my goal is never to preach a sermon so that I get a compliment. It's always so that uh, we dive into the Word of God and it impacts us. So I hope that something Holy Spirit highlighted for you today. I hope that there's some area where uh, you get to pick up the narrative again and the way you talk to old self, new self the way you get to agree with God's truth and celebrate what he's done and who you are now, being renewed into the image of God, getting back on track in every possible way. Uh, maybe someone in here, you've really gotten far off track and you're really ashamed and confused and don't know how to get back. I'd love to invite you forward for prayer today. Um, sometimes Satan gets us so wrapped up in a webs of lies, deceit, shame, and it goes into depression and it's hard to find our way out. Some of you, though, you're right on the cusp of breakthrough. I mean, I'm serious. You could go home today and say, you know what? That part of my life that's been lying to me, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and stomp on it. You're dead now. You're dead. I'm going to tell you every day, whether you try to get my attention or not, you're dead until I stop thinking about you. And some of you, you're that close to breakthrough. Just change the way you talk. Change the way you talk to it. Talk about your, who you are in Jesus. That, tell that thing it's not part of your life anymore until it goes away, until devil knows that's not a thing that's going to work in your life anymore. All right, let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you that uh, we don't stand here subject to anything, any power that's even close to the greatness of your power. Uh, we stand under the great power of Jesus Christ, who really did die on the cross and really was raised from the dead, and who says in his word that we are aligned with him in burial and in resurrection, and that our old self is dead. And we get to this privilege now of considering the old life dead day by day. We get to talk to ourselves. We get to declare truth. We get to celebrate God's truth. God, we thank you that you're not just a piece of our life. You're the whole of our life. And we belong to you. That there is no other master. Not our thinking. Uh, not our enemy, Satan. Not our emotions. Not our past. But Jesus, you are our master. I just thank you for people today getting breakthrough, getting able to, to take some forward steps and stomping on ground uh, that needs to be dead, taking a victorious stomp on that thing. I just thank you that whoever, you know, the old yeller example, where old yeller is trying to uh, find his way back to life in our lives, I just thank you that our foot is stronger and that old self gets to get stamped to death today in Jesus' name.